it says we are live can someone real quickly check the live stream and confirm that we are live okay here it goes hold on i am live streaming right now come and join us hold on in jesus almighty name praise be the god and father of our lord and savior jesus christ I invoke the Father of my Lord and Savior, my Lord and King, my Lord and love, the Lord Jesus Christ, to bless this session, to anoint my mouth, to anoint my thoughts, to anoint my body and the power of the Holy Spirit, filling me with the Holy Spirit, loosening my tongue to speak truth without error, to protect me from stammering confusion, to speak the truth and the power of the Spirit with the love of Jesus Christ, to bless the people of God, to strengthen the people of God. <clears throat> And the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus as the Father cleanses my heart and motives not to do it for the praise of men or to tickle ears, but for the glory and majesty of his beloved, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, have your way with us. We love you. We love Jesus, your son. We love your spirit. Bind up all attacks of the enemy. Save us and our loved ones from the enemy. Save my daughters and my wife from the enemy. And clothe us with your spirit and cover every one of us with the precious blood of Jesus. We love you, Father. Have your way. Bless this session in Jesus' name. Now we Father, Son, and Spirit. In Jesus name. All righty then. Okay, I'm just announcing on Facebook that the live stream is live. Look at it. I just started live stream. Everyone's there. back. Hey, Joshua Neville. Praise the Lord Jesus. I just started. We're going to do the Christmas story. We're going to talk a little bit about Christmas. Now, I know that most of you guys know this stuff so that you're probably not hear anything new so bear with me and thank the lord jesus for you that you know your word and you seek to live it out for the glory of christ but remember we are creatures of repetition right the more we hear something repeated over and over again the better we become by the grace of god's spirit <clears throat> the better we'll be able to then recall that information and use it to glorify christ and teach others right so most of the stuff you'll hear You've heard it, right? So I hope it still blesses you nonetheless. And I pray the Lord Jesus will now anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears and strengthen my chest and lungs and my voice box to stay strong in the power of the Spirit for the glory of Christ, right? Every good gift is from the child God. Everything imperfect is from us. So if anything good comes out tonight, that's our Lord. May he get the glory as he watches over us and our loved ones. My precious daughters and their mother in Jesus name all right now before I officially begin do you guys have a question before I begin the topic do you have a question and we'll lead we will allow the spirit to lead us be led by the spirit to talk about a variety of topics oops somebody just sent me something good evening sir good evening yes I'm just uh, letting people know because people sometimes prefer to go on the YouTube page so I'm gonna have to check both Pal Talk and the YouTube page to see if there are questions. I know on the YouTube page there's about a several second delay, right? All right. I guess there's no questions. All right. Let me just do this. Final link. All right. Now I can sign off Facebook. Hold on. Let's do this and then we can begin. All right. Here. Hey, we got someone on Facebook, MP. Pray God will be pleased to use my meager efforts to reach many people and that will bring in more people to listen. And pray God purify my heart that we're not doing it for numbers, but for the glory of Christ. It says, I remember asking you ages ago last year, but never got a full answer. I was wondering if you could address it live in this video. So someone's asking me a question. Let's see. Now, let's talk a little bit about Christmas. We know what the Christmas story is, right? Even though we don't know when the Lord Jesus was exactly born, from his blessed mother as she conceived and gave birth to him in the power of the Holy Spirit while a virgin. And I want to hammer that. A virgin whom no man touched. <clears throat> right? Even though we don't know when that exactly happened, we know it did happen and thank the Lord it happened, right? That our Lord entered time and space to redeem the creation that he brought into being by his sovereign infinite power, by his powerful word, right? Aren't you thankful for that? Can you imagine a world without Jesus? Can you imagine a world without the incarnation, the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Can you imagine a world without the resurrection? 
what hope would we have if our Lord hadn't entered the world and destroyed the grave, rising immortal, giving us proof that death is not final? What hope would we really have, right? Now, I like this gentleman's name. I don't know if you guys know, Vali Tudo is a martial art. It's a brutal, no-holds-barred martial art. So I guess this gentleman is a born-again Christian who loves Jesus, but also does Valley Tudo. Am I right, my friend? Just want to make sure I'm right. Oh, man. You do Valley Tudo, Patar? <laughs> Patar, man, I'm going to need you, bro. Because I used to do kickboxing and bodybuilding. I've stopped, but hopefully I'm getting there. I'm in my 280s now. Pray in Jesus' name. I'm going to get to 250 and then lose more weight and keep it off by the power of the Lord Jesus. But I need you, bro. I need you to come because you can be my bodyguard. And I have one individual in question that I, I'd like you to just, you know, pound him into submission. Just kidding. I'm joking because someone's going to now hear this re recording say, oh, threatening violence. As a side note, how many years have you done Valley Tudo? And you guys know who I have in mind, right? Without saying anything. But that to me. I day. How long have you been doing Valley Tudo, Padar? Yeah, we're going to talk about the Christmas story. Hold on. All right. Welcome. The question here is, can you just the I am saying that Rabbi Tovia Singer says does not translate or mean I am? I am the name of God. Rabbi Tovia Singer reveals why it is forbidden to utter the name of God. Sagat is the champ. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. God bless you. Okay. Now, I'm asked, I'm asked the question. Let me address this. Is God's name I am? And what MP is referring to is Exodus 3.14. Exodus 3.14, that's what he's referring to. So is that what you're referring to? I just, I, I'm just i assuming that's what the brother is referring to, but let me just confirm. He's, he's asking the question on the live stream. Are you referring to Exodus 3.14? Does the Hebrew word ehyeh translate as I am? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, so you can kick my face in. All right, another brother saying we can spar sometime. Yeah. Now, by the way, I don't know if you guys know, I was actually a world class kickboxer. Did you guys know that? How many of you guys knew, knew that? I was a world class kickboxer. Anyone know this or no? Did you guys know this about me? Yeah, actually, Valley and everyone else, I used to go to all the grocery stores and kick all the boxes. And I became great at it. <laughs> uh, man. No, but all kidding aside, I actually did kickboxing for many years. You know, I did, but I was not world class, obviously. All right. Okay. Let me answer the question. Exodus three fourteen. Yeah, I love Wing Chun because of Bruce Lee. Okay, let's let's talk about Exodus three fourteen and use that to dovetail into the Christmas story. Now. <clears throat> Oftentimes, when Christians want to demonstrate that our Lord Jesus Christ claimed to be God, they will take the words of our Lord in John 8, 58, and tie that with Exodus 3, 14. Now, thank the Lord for first and last. Are you able to post passages first and last? Can you post passages or no? Okay, not yet. Well, MM, maybe she can do it until you join us because she's going to be leaving in about 40 minutes. Okay, thank you, sister. Thank you for helping me. Lord bless you guys. Now, let's go to John 8, 58. Let's see what the question is, the objection is. This is an objection raised by Rabbi Tobia Singer, whose hatred of Christianity is matched by his love of Islam. Right? It's quite clear this man bends over backwards to appease Muslims, but will do everything he can, can to offend Christians. Right? And no wonder he's in Indonesia which has the highest concentration of Muslims in the world. And now John 8, 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. I am. I, I didn't know that. That would be news to me. You may be right. Now, Christians will say, See, Jesus Christ, our Lord here, took the name of God that God gave to Moses and applied it to himself, thereby identifying himself as the God of Moses. Yahweh. Now, what passage 
are Christians referring to when they make that assertion? Exodus 3.14. Let's go to Exodus 3.14. Trusting the Spirit to fill me, to do justice to this topic. Valley Tudor, are you done with your exam? So you're free now? It's good to be back with you guys live streaming. Really, I missed you guys. Thank the Lord we're going to get back in the saddle, right? It's really good to be with my brothers and sisters. And I can tell tell you guys, you guys are family because you are regulars, and I have actually have a bond with you, and I thank the Lord for that. Exodus 3, 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now, for a Christian, this is clear, right? God says to Moses, I am. Jesus says to the Jews, I am. Thereby, Jesus is claiming the name of God, right? Seems clear as day, doesn't it? Jessica, how are you? God bless you. Yusuf, hey, brother, good to see you. We're just chatting on, on my Facebook page. So good to see you, all of you. Devante, all of you. God bless you, and I pray the Lord will use me to bless all of you, right? The problem is, is that the Hebrew word, I am that I am, is ehye, excuse the butchering of the Hebrew, ehye, ashir, ehye. Now, the word ehye, right, it's actually future tense. It's a form of the verb haya, right? So ehye literally means I will be. However, here's a problem. As many scholars will tell you, the Hebrew language is a very complex language in that just because a verse may use a future tense verb, that doesn't mean that the verb is referring to something in the future. Right? In other words, although the verb is future tense, I will be. The context will determine whether the tense of the verb is referring to something in the future or is it referring to a present reality. See, this is this is how the Hebrew language works. Is everyone with me? I don't want to confuse you. I don't want to bore you with this. So although ahye is I will be, the context may suggest that this future tense verb is actually being used in a present tense. So that it's not I will be, it actually is I am. Everyone with me there? You understand the nuances of the Hebrew language? That it's complex. So you can't just look at the tense of the verb. You have to see how the verb is being used in a context to determine whether it has a future tense in mind or is it referring to a present reality. If you're confused, put a two. Because I don't want to move on without you getting this point, because it's vitally important to understand this point by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Is everyone clear? So no one's confused here? Trusting you're listening. No one's confused. That although ehye means I will be, it's future tense, that doesn't mean that in Exodus 3.14 has to be translated as such, because the Hebrew language is such that you can use a future tense verb even though you have a present reality in mind. And this is also true with verbs that are past tense. There is something called the prophetic perfective verb in Hebrew, where although the verb is past tense, it's actually referring to a future reality. That, that verb is also is often used in the context of prophecies. You'll read prophecies where the prophets are speaking of future events as already taking place. For example, Isaiah 53. If you actually read Isaiah 53 carefully, Isaiah is describing the suffering servant as already having suffered, already having died, already being glorified and exalted and raised to life. So if you read Isaiah 53, this future event is described as a past event, as something that already took place. This is known as the prophetic perfective, where prophets by inspiration of the Holy Spirit are seeing the event unfold before their mind's eyes, and they're describing the event as already having taken place, even though the event 
hasn't taken place in time and space. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Guys, let me know because now I'm trying to get a little technical, but not confuse you by the grace of God. Infuse wisdom by the grace of God's spirit. Everyone got it? First and last, all you guys? Let's see over here on YouTube. Okay, I guess you're getting it. All right. So with that said, can we determine whether Exodus 3.14 has a future tense <clears throat> application or a present tense application? In other words, when God says to Moses, tell Israel, Ehyeh has sent me. Should that be rendered, tell Israel, I am has sent me? Or should it be rendered as, I will be has sent me? The problem is, there are good arguments on both sides. Some will argue that in context, God is saying that he is the ever-living, ever-existing one. That I am. I am the ever-living one. And because I ever live, I will be with you both now till the end of the age. So some will argue that God is referring to his timeless existence as the everlasting one, the one who forever lives. He'll always be with his people and he'll always be faithful to do all that he promises in respect to the covenant that he's made with his people. You, you with me there? So some will argue that's the emphasis on God's timeless existence. I am. I'm the ever living one, the one who, who forever lives. And as such, you can trust me that I'll always be with you to do all that I promise to do. Others will say the emphasis is not on God's existence, but on God's faithfulness to fulfill all the promises he made to the patriarchs. So it should be future tense. I will be with you. I will be all that I promise to be to you. So there are good arguments on both sides. Before you do, let me just make this point. So, the fact of the matter is that it is very hard to prove conclusively that Ehye should be rendered as I am as opposed to I will be. I have to concede that. There are good arguments on both sides and another strong argument for taking it as truly a future tense that God is actually saying, I will be with you, Moses. I will be with Israel. I will be all that I promised to be to them. And I will fulfill all the promises I made to their fathers. Is Exodus 3.12. Exodus 3.12 seems to tip the evidence in favor of rendering Ehye as future tense. I will be. Let's look at Exodus 3.12. Let me know if this is putting you to sleep, if this is boring you. Because if it is, we'll change gears because I'm here to and not necessarily entertain you, but not bore you as well, but to educate you by the power of the Holy Spirit as the Lord fills me with wisdom to handle these subjects carefully, reverently, and accurately for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay. Guys, read Exodus 3.12. And he said, certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, Ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Did you notice the future tense verb? I will be with thee. Moses, I'm promising to be with you now and in the future. Well, guess what the verb I will be happens to be? Can anyone take a guess? What do you think the phrase I will be happens to be in Hebrew? Let me show you. Let me get you the link to the interlinearbible.org, which provides an interlinear of the Hebrew text of Exodus 3.14. You go to interlinearbible.org. Let me show it to you. So you see it with your own eyes. Exodus 3.12. Let me get you the link. Here it goes. We'll talk about the Greek in a minute. Hold on. Everyone click there. Everyone click there. Here's the link for you guys. We're watching on the live stream. Oh, I guess it won't work. Hold on. Yeah, it's not showing up. All right, sorry. Sorry, guys, it won't show up. Anyway, Exodus 3, 12. Let me do this real quick. 
Exodus 3.12. I gave you the link. Let's read. Wa yo yomer ki ehyeh imak. Do you see the verb ehyeh? It's right there. Ehyeh. Those of you clicked on it, did you see the verb ehyeh? Wa yomer ki ehyeh imak. So notice there's the verb ehyeh. In Exodus 3.12. I will be imak with you. I will be. I'm with you and I will be with you in the future when you go to Pharaoh. Now let's see what the verb is in verse 14. In verse 14. Okay, let's see what the verb is in verse 14. Okay, let me show you. Here you go. Here's the link. Here's the link. Notice what it is. Wa Yomer Elohim El Moshe Ehye Ashir Ehye. There it goes, the same verb in 12. So you can make a strong case contextually in light of <clears throat> in light of <clears throat> verse 12 that it is truly future tense in light of verse 12. You see it? So that eh, yeah, should be, I will be. Well, now, here's the dilemma for you guys. If eh, yeah, is future tense, I will be. What connection does this have with Jesus' words in John 8, 58, when he says, before Abraham came into being, I am. If the, the verb eh, yeah, is, I will be, not I am, then how do you connect this with Jesus' words that before Abraham was, he is. Claims to be I am. There is no connection anymore, is there? Right? There is no connection, right? Is everyone with me there? You want to make sure you're getting it. That means Jesus is not claiming the name of God in Exodus 3.14. There is no connection between Jesus' I am in John 8 58 with what God said to Moses in Exodus 3 14 because there eh, yeah, doesn't translate as I am but I will be so this is the point that Rob Tobias Singer is trying to make <clears throat> he's trying to show that God is not saying I am that's not what he's claiming there and therefore there's no connection with the words of the Lord Jesus Christ that's the objection now how do you get around the objection does anyone know how to get around this objection? Very simply, although John 8, 58 may not connect with Exodus 3, 14, it does connect with other passages in the Hebrew Bible where the Hebrew clearly is I am, where God speaks of himself as the I am in context similar to the way the Lord Jesus identifies himself as I am. Everyone with you there? So, although the connection with Exodus 3.14 may not be strong, you can make a stronger case by looking at passages in Deuteronomy 32 and Isaiah, where there, clearly, the Hebrew is I am, because either God says Anihu or Anokihu, both of which render as I am he, which the Greek translated as Ego Aimi, when the Jews translated the hebrew bible into greek about 280 years before the birth of, birth of our lord starting with the first five books of moses those jews who translated the hebrew into greek in these passages rendered the hebrew as ego i me i am the very greek words found in the gospel of john every time jesus identifies himself as i am for you to understand the point let's go to deuteronomy 32 39 you see this guy, W. Mikas, is so impatient. It's like, it's le duda. Duda, duda. He can't wait and stop asking questions until I finish the first point. He went from asking about the Septuagint to not asking about Mark 650. He's so busy asking me questions that he's not listening to my answers. But we love this brother. And may God teach us to love each other and be patient for the glory of Christ. Because I am a work in progress. And when I pray for patience, God brings me people to teach me patience. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Deuteronomy 32, 39. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Believe me, God is showing me my imperfections, and I trust the Lord is taking me to a higher level to be more like Christ. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Here, the phrase is not ehye, it's anihu. Anihu. And when this was translated into Greek, it was translated as ego aimi. The very Greek words found in the Gospel of John, every time John translates Jesus' I am statements into Greek. Because we assume that the Lord spoke either Hebrew or Aramaic. And John is giving us a Greek translation of Jesus' Hebrew or Aramaic words. So when Jesus says I am, either he would have said anihu or anokihu, and then John translated that phrase as ego aimi in the Greek. Be that as it may, now look at what God says in Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I, am he. In Hebrew, anihu. I am he. It's not ehye. It's anihu. I am he. Okay? Thank you, Joshua. Lord bless you. There is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Now notice what God says. I am he. Anihu. The Greek rendered this as ego I me. I am. There is no other God beside me. Now to prove that he is the God, and there is no other God besides him, the I am. He says that he is the one who kills, and he is the one who makes alive. He is the one who wounds, and he is the one who heals. And there is none that can deliver out of his hand. Now notice, pay attention, folks. God as the I am he is the one who kills, makes alive, is the one who wounds, and heals. And there is no power that can deliver out of his hand. Now, let's see if our Lord Jesus described himself in a similar manner. Pay attention. God as the I am he, in Deuteronomy 32, 39, he is the one who determines when a person will die. In other words, if I kill you and I'm successful, note that the reason why I was successful in killing you is because God decreed that that person would die by my killing them. If God didn't want that person to die, no matter what I did, I would not successfully be able to kill that person. That's what God is saying here. Ultimately, life and death are in the hands of God. Ultimately, sickness and health are in the hands of God. So if a doctor cures you, no, it wasn't the doctor who cured you, but God was pleased to use the doctor to cure you because all healing ultimately comes from God. So do you understand what Deuteronomy 32, 39 is saying? Do you understand his point here? So when a doctor heals you of cancer, note, it was God who was pleased to use the doctor to heal you of cancer, right? You get my point? Because the doctor could have done anything and everything in its power, and you still end up dying of cancer. Because ultimately, all healing, all disease, life and death are in the hands of God. This is the point of Deuteronomy 32, 39. Is that clear? I just want to make sure you get the point. Now, does our Lord claim to possess these defining characteristics, abilities, and functions that define Yahweh. Because in Deuteronomy 32, 39, Yahweh is proving that he alone is God by making certain assertions in regards to his ability, an ability that no other God possesses. Because he alone is God, he alone controls life and death. He alone determines whether a person will die or live, whether a person will be healed or be wounded. And he alone has the sovereign power to guarantee that no creature is able to deliver out of his hand. Now, let's see if Jesus made similar claims. Let's go to John 10, 27 to 30. Let's see if our Lord made similar claims. Let's see. John 10, 27 to 30. 
John 10, 27, 30. Guys, pay attention to what Yahweh said in Deuteronomy 32, 39, to what our Lord is going to say here. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Did you notice it? I give all sheep, all true believers, never-ending immortal life. And there is none that can pluck out of my hand. My father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. And that verb are in Greek is esme. It's literally plural. We are one. Showing that Jesus is not the same person as the father. But he is one with the father. And the father's ability to guarantee the everlasting preservation of all true believers. Did you catch the language of our Lord? What did Yahweh say in Deuteronomy 32, 39? I kill and make alive. I wound and I heal, and there's none that can deliver out of my hand. Notice the words of the Lord Jesus carefully. The Lord says, I give unto all sheep, no matter how numerous, no matter where they're at, I give them everlasting life. And there's no one that can pluck them out of my hand. Sound familiar? Does this sound familiar? What does it sound like, saints? Does the Lord sound like Yahweh God in Deuteronomy 32, 39? Where Yahweh says, see now that I, even I am he. I wound and make alive and none can deliver out of my hand. And yet here the Lord Jesus says, I give not just life. I don't just bring people to life. I give them never-ending immortal life. And there's no one who can pluck my sheep out of my hand. Sure sounds like Jesus Christ thinks that he's the I am he of Deuteronomy 32, 39. Is that clear? So I wouldn't tie Jesus' I am statements with Exodus 3.14. I would tie Jesus' I am statements with passages such as Deuteronomy 32.39 and others. Let me give you a few more. Let's go to Isaiah 43.10-13. to 13. Isaiah 43.10-13. to 13. Okay. Isaiah 43, 10 to 13. Watch here. Isaiah 43, 10 to 13. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. Pay attention. Tell me if the language sounds familiar. And my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Now again, in Hebrew, it's anihu. This is rendered in the Greek translation of Isaiah as ego aimi. I am he, ego aimi. In Greek, anihu in Hebrew. Before me, there was no God form. Neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, Yahweh, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange, strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Now watch verse 13. Yea, before the day was, I am he, anihu, which in Greek would be rendered as ego aimi. Notice, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? You guys see it again? God says twice that he is the I am he, anihu, which in Greek would be ego amy. And in 13, he says something interesting. Before the day was. You know what that means? You know what that means when he says before the day was? Does anyone have a clue? What does it mean, before the day was, I am he? Before creation. Before there was time, that's what it means. In other words, God is saying, 
in eternity I am he so he's showing that he is the eternally existing one before time before the day was made in eternity I am he I am the eternally existing one and there's none that can deliver out of my head now what did our Lord say in John 10 28 I give all sheep immortal incorruptible physical life and I give all sheep <clears throat> moral incorruption because when Christ ra raises all true believers not only will he raise them to live in physical immortality where they will never experience death pain suffering disease he'll also transform all believers to be morally incorruptible and only God has that kind of power and yet Jesus claims that power and then he says there is none who can pluck them out of my hand notice again yahweh says i am he in the context of being the eternally existing one without any any person being able to deliver anyone out of god's hand does it sound like jesus is speaking as if he's the god of the old testament You guys catch this or before I move on now I hope I'm not putting you to sleep with this I hope the gentleman who asked me the question on the live stream is still around are you there I guess his name was I guess he left MP MP you still there I'm answering your question right so for the rest of you who are listening I know I'll put somebody to sleep Valley to rest I guess put you to sleep here, Yahweh claims to be the I am he in the context of being the eternally existing one, being there before time was created, with no one being able to deliver out of his hand. Our Lord says he gives never-ending, everlasting, immortal life and transforms believers to become morally incorruptible and guaranteeing that there is no power that can deliver them out of his caring hand of protection and preservation. You with me there? So Jesus sounds as if he's making himself out to be the God of the Old Testament. No one can pluck and deliver out of Yahweh's hand. No one can pluck and deliver out of Jesus' hand. Yahweh makes alive. Jesus gives everlasting life. And even in this regard, Christ speaks as if he's God. Because in Isaiah 43, 13, Yahweh says, Before the day was, meaning before time, in eternity I am now let's go back and look at John 8 58 in context to see if Christ is claiming to be the I am in the same context that Yahweh did in Isaiah 43 13 when Yahweh claimed to be the I am in eternity let's see John 8 56 to 59 for the context John 8 56 59 for the context Right in front. John 8, 56, 59. I didn't? Now, did the Lord Jesus claim to be I am in a similar context to what we find in Isaiah 43, 13? Because there, Yahweh says he's I am in eternity. Right? In eternity. Now, is our Lord claiming to be I am in a similar context of making himself up to be eternal and timeless? Let's see. John 8, 56 to 59. Okay, let's read. Read with me. Okay. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Now notice, they're baffled. You're saying Abraham saw you and was glad. Doesn't that imply, Jesus, that you're claiming to have seen Abraham? Okay. But hold on. You're not even 50 years old. How could you have seen Abraham? Now, notice our Lord doesn't correct them. He doesn't say, no, you misunderstand me. I didn't see Abraham. Abraham saw me in a prophetic vision. God made known to Abraham that I would come to save him and his offspring. 
and he trusted in God's promise that God would send me and rejoiced at the fact that I would come eventually to save Israel as well as the world. He doesn't correct them. He actually confirms they understood him correctly. Yes, you're right. My words do imply that I personally saw Abraham in order to know that Abraham rejoiced at seeing me. But hold on. You're not yet 50 years old. Abraham's been dead for 2,000 years. How is that possible? Now let's read the response of our Lord. John 8, 58. The response of our Lord. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now let me explain the significance of this. Here that verb was is genestai. That verb means coming into being. Literally, what Jesus said is, before Abraham came into being, came into existence, before he was born, I already was and will always be. So the Lord is contrasting two types of existences. An existence that comes into being, that's created in a point of time, and an existence that always has been. So unlike Abraham, who came into being, I've always been and will always be. I am. In other words, I'm timeless and eternal. This is why 59, we read, Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. You catch it? The Jews understood that in making this assertion, our Lord was making himself out to be God, because only God's existence is timeless. Only God is eternal and timeless. And yet Jesus says, I am in the context of being timeless, having always been and will always be, unlike Abraham, whose existence was created and came into being. Did everyone get that? That puts you to sleep. Who fell asleep here? Everyone got it? Now, how does this tie in with our Lord identifying himself with the God of the Old Testament? Do you remember Isaiah 43, 13? What did it say? God said, before the day was, I am he. he Hebrew would be anihu, but in Greek, it would be rendered as ego I me. In eternity, I am. In other words, I am timeless, always been, and will always be. Similarly, Jesus says, unlike your father Abraham, whose being was created, who came into existence, I've always been, will always be. In other words, don't let my physical appearance mislead you. I'm much older than 50. I'm eternal, unlike your father Abraham, who had a beginning. So Christ uses the I am in the same context that Yahweh did in Isaiah 43, 13, to denote his timeless, eternal existence. That's how you show that Jesus is claiming to be God in his use of the phrase, I am. That's how you show it. Not necessarily connecting it with Exodus 3.14, but connecting it with passages in Deuteronomy 32.39 and passages in Isaiah 43. Is that clear? I've written an entire series of articles on this. So Lord willing, I'll try to post it in the description box to the video, and I'll give you the links in YouTube, not YouTube, I'm sorry, Pal Talk shortly. Now notice, brothers and sisters, how impatient we Christians are, and I am guilty because I want God to act for me in my problem like yesterday. God is teaching me patience and trust in this. We have my friend Devante Wise, a brother in Christ. Okay? He's saying, I guess I won't get my question answered. Now, help me understand, brothers and sisters. Was I not engaged in trying to provide a thorough answer to a question that was asked of me about 20 minutes ago? Now, wouldn't you think that a person would wait until I finish my response to the first question in order to get to a second question? But hey, remember, Christ came to save sinners, of which I am the chief. And we all have issues that God is working in and through us to save us from so we can become more like Christ. Forgive me, Devante, 
that I didn't tell MP to take a hike and that his question was irrelevant so I can take yours. Please forgive me because I love you, brother. Now, what was your question? Don't you love it? My sarcasm? Mikas, you went all in, my man? <laughs> now, I wasn't talking about you, Mikas. We have another brother on YouTube saying, I guess I won't get my question answered. Guys, believe it or not, even though when you look at me, you think I'm the most amazing creation of God that's flawless and perfect, I can't answer multiple questions at the same time. I know that's shocking. You? No way. So that means my trust in you was misplaced after all. You better believe it. Anyone who looks to me for hope and salvation, man, are you a sad case. Anyway, Devante, what's your question? So I can answer it by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll get to the Greek translation of Exodus 3.14 in a moment. And I'll speak about that and elaborate on that as well. I'm just waiting for Devante. Let's see what the question was. Uh, Devante, I thought the brother Sagat is the champ already answered that. You cannot reason with people who will explain away all the evidence, right? No matter what evidence you show, they'll always explain it away to refute the fact that these are not ethnic Jews, but that the Gentiles are really Jews. So what's the point of trying to reason with people whose position is, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind is made up already. You can't reason with such a person, so why even try? It is so easy to show that the Gentiles are not Israelites because even the Hebrew Bible makes a distinction between Israel and the nations whom God desires to save, such as passages you'll find in Isaiah 49, verses 5 and 6. But you can't reason with them. So what's the point? If it's an open-minded person, then I would show him such passages. But if the person has already closed his mind and will explain every reference to nations, Gentiles, Goyim, as a reference to ethnic Jews who are scattered, then that means this person's position is unfalsifiable. Why waste your time? You get my point? So now, let me address the Greek translation of Exodus 3.14. W. Mikas wanted me to address it. Now, when Exodus 3.14 was translated into Greek by Jews, not Christians, how did they render the phrase, Ehye, Ashir, Ehye? How do they render the phrase Ehye? Now, you guys ready for me to talk a little bit about the Greek translation of Exodus 3.14? Or are you guys already bored with this? And you want me to move on to something else? Because I'm here to serve you for the sake of the Lord. Right? You guys want me to address this? The Greek translation of Exodus 3.14. Now, by the way, before I move on, was my response clear that you don't tie Jesus' I am statements with Exodus 3.14? But you tie his statements to other passages in the Hebrew Bible, like Deuteronomy 32, 39, and Isaiah 43, 10 to 13, where clearly there, the Hebrew phrase is anihu, other places is anochihu, and that is present tense. Even though, like I said, the Hebrew language is very nuanced, you may use a past tense, even though you're speaking of a future event, or you may use a future tense, even though you have a present action in mind. So the Hebrew language is quite sophisticated, and the context will be crucial in determining whether the verb is truly future or present, or whether the past tense verb is really referring to something in the past, or something in the present or future. Okay. For the rest of you, do you want me to comment on the Greek translation of Exodus 3.14? Put a 1. If yes, put a 2. If no. Because I want to be used of the Lord to bless you and serve you and educate you by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. All right. Well, the Greek renders the phrase ehye, ashir ehye, as ego aimi ha'on. 
ha'on. Now, ego aimi ha'on literally means I am the being. It can also be re rendered as I am the existing one. So if you read Exodus 314, God says to Moses, You are tell the Israelites, Ehye Ashir Ehye has sent me. Tell them, Ehye has sent me to you. Now, the second occurrence of Ehye in Exodus 314 is rendered as Ha'on, not as Ego Emi, not as Ego Emi. So when in the last part of verse 14 it says, Tell them that Ehye has sent me to you. There in the Greek, it doesn't say ego I me, it says ha'on. Tell them the being has sent me. Or tell them the existing one has sent me. In other words, the Greek translation of Exodus 314 does not render Ehye as ego I me. Which is what we find in John 8 58 and other passages of the Gospel of John. Rather, Ehye is rendered as Ha'on. Ha'on. So even the Greek version, they will argue, does not connect with Jesus' I am statements in John because when John translates the Lord's I am statements in Greek, he doesn't use Ha'on. He uses ego aimi, whereas the Greek translation of Exodus 314 doesn't use ego aimi, it uses ha'on. Does everyone get that? Did everyone understand the point? Before I move on to respond, if you're confused, put a two. Say, Sam, I'm confused, help me. If it's making sense, all glory to the triune God, all glory to the Lord Jesus, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that he's enabled me to make these very technical issues clear and understandable. So all praise be to his name. No one confused? Light, you're getting this, Christian princess? Let me know before I move on. Everyone got it? All right. Praise the Lord. Now, how do you respond to that? Well, here's how you respond. Let me get you the link to blueletterbible.org. It's concordance. Okay, here it is. You go here. You'll see Exodus 3.14. It provides a Greek translation. Now, some of you can't read the Greek, but I know first and last can. can. You look at it, you'll see it says Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew. It says Kai Ipen. Now I'm giving you the Rasmian pronunciation of Greek, which Greek speakers would laugh at or cringe. Hatheos. Kai Ipen Hatheos. And said the God, Pros Mosin. Ego Aimi Haon. Ego Aimi Haon. Right? And then you'll see Haon appearing again. Now, let me show you the phrase Haon in the Greek New Testament because the New Testament was inspired in Koine Greek. Okay? Let's go to Revelation 1.8. Revelation 1.8, I'm going to give you the link. Okay. Here's the interlinear. Here's the interlinear of Revelation 1.8. Guys, click there. When you click there, you're going to see the Greek text. It says, Ego I me to Alpha Kai to Omega Arche kai telas lege hakurias haon hakurias says the Lord haon there goes haon now let's see what own means in Greek let's look for it which is here it goes I'm gonna give it to you sorry for going slow but I don't want to rush through this now watch here guys. Here's the link. Click on it. There you're going to see that own is a present participle of I me. Did you catch it? Here's the link. Surprise, surprise. 
own is simply the participle form of the verb I me. Participle is a verbal adjective. In other words, what this lexicon is telling you, that that word own is simply another form of the verb I me. So own is synonymous with I me. Do you guys see it? It's present tense, like I me. So it's simply another form of the verb I me. So although Jesus said ego I me, to say ha own or to use the word own would be simply another form of I me. So basically, God and Jesus are saying the same thing. In Exodus 3.14, the Greek version is showing us that God is saying that he is the existing one, the one who always exists. And that's the exact same way Jesus uses the word ego I me or the, the words ego I me in John 8.58, that I am the one who exists. Unlike Abraham who came into being, I exist. I am existence. I've always been, will always be. That's the exact same meaning of ha'on in Exodus 3.14. Ha'on in Exodus 3.14 is telling us that God is the timeless one, the ever existing one, the one who exists eternally, which is the same way that Jesus is using the words ego I me. Like ha'on in Exodus 3.14, Jesus' ego I me in John 8, 58 means that Christ is the timeless one, the existing one, the being who always is. It's basically synonymous in meaning. Do you guys see that? Do you guys catch it? In other words, the phrase ha'on in Exodus 3.14 is synonymous, has the same meaning, synonymous, has the same meaning as Jesus' words, Jesus' words in John 8, 58. In John 8, 58. Because there Jesus says, ego I mean, in the context of contrasting Abraham's creation with his timeless existence. And in Exodus 3.14, the Greek phrase ha'on denotes that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the ever-existing one. So both the Greek of Exodus 3.14 and the Greek of John 8.58 are pointing to the timeless existence of Yahweh and Jesus. Because on is a present participle of aimi. In other words, it's simply another form of the present tense verb aimi. They're synonymous in meaning. You get it? Is it, am I making sense or did I confuse you? Before I move on, I want to make sure you're getting it. Lord bless you too, brother. Is this making sense? Nobody's confused, huh? Light, Christian princess, Brita. No one's confused, mighty men of all. You're getting it too? Glory to Jesus Christ. I thought it was going to be more complicated. But praise the Lord Jesus. It's not as complicated as I thought it'd be. Because the Spirit is making it easy for us to understand. So praise the sovereign Spirit of the living God. Wow, you got it, huh? Now, why is the Greek version of Exodus 3.14 important? Let me explain why. The Jews translated Exodus 3.14 into Greek as... Ha own, not Christians. You know what that tells you? That tells you that those Jews who read the Hebrew understood the verb ehye not as future tense, I will be. They understood ehye to be a present tense verb, which is why they rendered it as ha own, which means that the Jews who read the Hebrew understood that ehye was referring to God's timeless existence. He is, I am meaning the one who always is. So the Jews understood this future tense verb as present tense, denoting God's timeless existence. Is that clear? Everyone, everyone getting this? And no one's confused, huh? All right. 
glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what turned out to be an objection aimed at undermining the deity of Christ ends up backfiring against the anti-Trinitarian because clearly Jesus' use of Egoimi in John 8, 58 points to his timeless existence, his eternal existence, and only God and God alone is timeless and eternal. So much for that objection by Tobias Singer and others who seek to diminish, attack, undermine the absolute essential deity and divine honor, worth, and glory of Christ. Because Christ is God, whether they like it or not. Praise his only name. Yep, they do. Now, with that said, I'm going to stop this live stream and start another one. And we'll pick it up in 10 minutes. So let's take a 10-minute break. Lord Jesus willing, the second part of the live stream to start shortly. Hopefully, this time we'll talk about Christmas, if God is pleased. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahweh, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Save us and our loved ones, my wife and children, and cover us under your precious blood. Hallelujah. Let's stop it. Hold on. Those of you listening live stream, I'm going to start another live stream within 10 minutes, Lord willing.